can call the meeting to order and can I welcome you to this, the second meeting of the Public Petitions Committee in 2018. Can I remind mem members and others in the room to switch phones and other devices to silent. The first item on the agenda today is consideration of two new petitions on which we will hear evidence. The first petition we will take evidence on is petition 1677 on make more money available to mitigate welfare cuts. This petition was submitted by Dr Sarah Glynn on behalf of the Scottish Unemployed Workers Network. Can I welcome Dr Glynn to the meeting, along with John McArdle, who is a co-founder and campaign coordinator for Black Triangle, an organisation run by and for disabled people. Can I welcome you both and thank you for attending this morning. Um, you have the opportunity to make a brief opening statement of up to five minutes. After that, the committee will ask a few questions to help inform our consideration of the petition. Um, thanks for inviting us here. So our petition is a response to immediate and severe need. So put simply, if our parliament can't protect Scotland's poorest and most vulnerable citizens, then of what use is it? So here today you've got representatives from the Scottish Unemployed Workers Network and Black Triangle, but we've also discussed this petition with people in West Gap in Glasgow, with Edinburgh Coalition Against Poverty and Inclusion Scotland. And we're all of us only too aware from the people we work with and help of the devastation that so-called welfare reform is causing. As a nation, we've become accustomed to newspaper stories of benefit decisions that have left families in fear and destitution. And these aren't the results of glitches or bad apples. Their examples are not always the worst examples of what happens when a system that was established to provide a measure of social security is, in, is transformed into a form of social control. And I think some indication of the scale of suffering that this is causing is given by the rising demand for food banks, which is a form of charity that should have died out with the welfare state, with the establishment of the welfare state. What the UK government has called welfare reform is often described simply as welfare cuts. And these cuts are huge, and that's primarily what we're here to talk about but we're also seeing a very deliberate qualitative change, a return to the Victorian belief that individuals are to blame for their own misfortune. And we've been pleased to see that the Scottish Government are publicly rejecting this approach. There's been a lot of talk about dignity, but this isn't of any help if folk are still left to struggle for survival. Last week, the European Committee of Social Rights produced yet another report pulling up the UK government for the meanness of their benefit system. In the post-war years, benefit rates rose in line with earnings or prices, whichever was the greater. And then in 1980, they were tied to prices, and while incomes and living standards rose, benefits were left far behind. And now we've had almost two decades of cuts and freezes. People on benefits are being excluded from more and more activities that others take for granted. Things like school trips, everyday socialising with friends, a good varied diet, decent heating, a home computer. And that's when the system is working smoothly. As the papers that have been prepared for this committee note, the Social Security Committee has con commissioned research that gives figures for the benefits lost to people in Scotland since 2010 as a result of welfare cuts. By 2020 to 21, these will add up to over £2 billion a year. You can also see in that, those documents the losses resulting from different benefit cuts, both to individuals and altogether. Some are very large, and some households are suffering from several of these cuts simultaneously. In addition, there's vast amounts of distress and ongoing complications result from what we can only describe as a criminal level of negligence in the workings of the various DWP bureaucracies. Benefit delays are the cause of many requests for extra help from the Scottish, Wel Scottish Welfare Fund or from food banks. People are astonishingly resilient, and generally that's a good thing, but it's frightening to see how people's expectations adjust to surviving in a world where options are always constricting. And this has its own consequences, feeding into an epidemic of mental health problems, physical health problems, and isolation. This petition is deliberately not prescriptive about how best to mitigate this misery. What we're calling for is an acknowledgement of the need to put more money into the system to help those affected, and for this to be done in a holistic way. Every cut translates into personal and social disasters, 
and each has generated calls for the Scottish Government to mitigate it. These not need to be looked at together, or it will be too easy for all these different and desperate needs to be set in competition with each other. We would, though, be happy to answer questions on some of the areas where more spending would make a real difference, and we've got quite a lot of evidence on that. We can also send stuff afterwards. So more help with discretionary housing payments, extra money for child benefits, more for the Scottish Welfare Fund, more for advice, more help for sick and disabled people, more help with people who've been, for people who've been sanctioned. It's a pity that this session is taking place so far into the debates on the Scottish budget, because the other side of the coin is, of course, the need to raise more money. Now that the budget has opened the door to more progressive taxation, and people have got used to this idea, let's make it really progressive and raise enough money to make a significant difference. We've also noted in our petition that the potential for re replacing council tax with a land value tax. I think to discuss that would need a session on its own, but we would refer you to the work that's already been done on this by Andy Whiteman for the Scottish Greens. Andy's report was written in 2010 and anticipated that the system could be up and running in five years. We appreciate that there's an understandable reluctance by the Scottish Government to spend money on things that should be being looked after by Westminster. It's galling when there's so much more to do. But when it comes to welfare, it is very, very necessary, even a matter of life and death. What more important role does Parliament have than protect a country, to protect a country's most vulnerable citizens and help create and preserve sustainable communities? So for those who believe Scotland's future lies in devolution, then that devolved Parliament must be put to full use. For those who believe that devolution is not enough, then it's important to use all the powers we have in order to demonstrate the need for more. And for those who can't see beyond the bottom line, well, when it comes to benefits, the phrase a stitch in time couldn't be more true. Help now can prevent family and social breakdown, which brings much greater financial costs as well as personal tragedies. And it puts money into deprived areas where it can have the greatest positive impact on the economy. The approach that's currently being followed by the Scottish Government may seem to be cautious and pragmatic, but unless it does more to help those at the sharp end of welfare reform, we will, left, we will be left with poor people and poor economics. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. Thank you very much indeed. Can I maybe start um, um, by asking, the petition calls for the Scottish Government to make more money available to mitigate the impact of UK government welfare cuts, and you've made the case effectively for that. And I understand that you obviously won't have a precise figure but roughly how much more money do you think uh, should be made available? I mean, if you were making a budget ask, we're, we've finished stage one, but we've another two stages to go. If you were going to make a budget ask, what would it look like? Well, I mean, ideally we would like to you know, mitigate that to, to two billion a year, but we appreciate that that is a, is a lot of money. I mean, there are, the, there are I mean, the more that, that can be done, the better. So for example, in things like the benefit cap, um, there was a paper done by the Scottish Greens looking at, do people know what the benefit cap is? It's, um, so at the moment, um, it's impacting, they reckon, well, it's currently affecting 3,700 houses, so households, and the, the Scottish government estimates that there's a total loss of 11 million and have only put up 8 million. So even, you know, three million on that would actually make it comprehensive and, and could make it automatic and would make a huge difference. But that is only just one thing. Obviously, um, I, I, I haven't seen the calculations, but I imagine that the, um, I, probably, I might even have them here. I mean, there's, there's the five pound on child benefits, which um, I know the Labour Party is supporting and there's been, there's a whole huge group of, of charities and third sector organisations is supporting that and they have got the evidence behind that which is reckoned to be the most effective way of, of putting money back in. Um, well, the, the biggest single cut is actually just the, the cuts right across the board, the freezing of benefits um, that's affect every, affected everybody. And this is deemed to be a, um, probably one of the most efficient ways of actually dealing with that. And I'm sure John's got something to say about the disabled, which is uh, people have been hit probably the worst. Well... There's definitely been 
um, disabled people have been extremely hard hit by the migration from disability living allowance to personal independence payment. Um, it's cold comfort for people who are being reassessed at the moment under the current regime uh, that um, we'll have our own system set up in a few years' time. Um, people are, are losing their, their entitlements now. Of 526,000 DLA claimants reassessed for PIP up until October 2016, 21% were rejected and 23% ended up worse off financially. Um, we also have the judgment from the, um, the, appeal, the Court of Appeal uh, this, before Christmas, which uh, the government at Westminster is not going to appeal, that um, people with mental health problems have been discriminated against uh, with regard to um, uh, mobility, um, uh, allowance for mobility within the DLA. Uh, so many people have been left stranded. They've lost their mobility vehicles, um, and it's been absolutely catastrophic. Um, the spectre we have now on the horizon is people being migrated uh, if there's a change of circumstance. Any change of circumstance will see them migrated to universal credit, um, and they'll le lose their severe disability premiums. They'll just be gone. So um, it's poverty and immiseration on a very vast scale, and... Um, I would have thought that uh, in a country that prides itself on being progressive, such as Scotland, um, that um, a, dis a serious discussion should be had about um, what we can do, given the powers that we have, to mitigate um, this catastrophe. It's been described by the chair of the, com of the uh, United Nations Committee on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, Theresia Dejeuner, as a human catastrophe catastrophe for disabled people. Um, that's no exaggeration. I don't think that the chair of a UN committee is given to hyperbole. Um, the UK government has been found to uh, be in breach of the uh, Convention on the Rights of Pers Persons with Disabilities um, in a grave and systematic way. Um, so given that the disabled community of Scotland faces uh, such a catastrophe, it's incumbent upon our government to step in and um, take very hard and um, well thought out measures to um, alleviate the suffering that people find themselves in. Can I just add a couple of things? Because I think that one, a couple of ways as well that um, money can be really targeted, I think is a lot more help through the Scottish Welfare Fund, which can you know, help some of people hardest hit from all different groups and also more money for people to give advice so that people do get the help they need and they get the benefits to start off with so um, they, you know, we don't, we're not picking up the pieces afterwards, which is obviously makes good sense because you know, we've come across people who've been told, well, we can't put your appeal through yet because actually we haven't got anybody to do it for months or the person that you're seeing is, is not with us and we don't have anybody else to replace them or people, even if they have got help, and help is very variable across the country, what, how much help is available, but even people who ha have got help have said, you know, the people who are helping us are just so busy and pressed they're not doing the job properly. Thanks. Angus MacDonald? Um, um, I think possibly... Um, uh, giving uh, disabled people uh, assistance uh, with their applications and negotiating the system is perhaps the most helpful thing of all. Okay, okay thanks very much. Angus MacDonald. Okay, thanks, uh, Convener. Good morning, Sarah. Uh, good morning, John. Um, in your petition, you've outlined the steps you took to raise the issue with uh, your local MSPs uh, and um, ultimately the majority of MSPs prior to, to submitting the petition and you also wrote separately to uh, the Minister for Social Security. Can you tell us about the responses that you received, um, particularly from the Scottish Government? Um, I, I haven't got them, them with me. I mean, it's, we didn't get very much that was very positive, to be honest. And, and I know the most recent question that was raised with uh, was that, actually wasn't by us, but by Edinburgh Coalition Against Poverty, um, writing to Jean Freeman about um, the, the money for, for well, people are being evicted, but the family evicted just this week, actually, as a result of this. I mean, it's absolutely horrific, and I can give you some more information about that. But 
I mean, that was a very, very disappointing response because, um, you know, the, 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 the Scot Scottish government prides itself, I think, on, on the housing legislation, particularly the homelessness legislation, but that doesn't mean anything if, if you haven't actually got the housing benefits to pay for homes and the people are being evicted because, because of that. So that was very disappointing. And again, sort of slightly pushing it back onto the councils in that particular case. But we haven't got very far, to be honest. It's been sort of, yeah, we take it on board, and, but, but nothing very constructive. And, and a list of obviously what, what they are, what is being done, but um, which, you know, and we're very appreciative of what, what has been done and what's been done with the bedroom tax, but it, it just actually shows us the difference that these things can make. Can you confirm you got an official response from the minister? Oh yeah, yeah, right, we've had okay. we've had a letter from the. We, okay, can yeah. you sh can you share that with the committee when, yeah, when you get the chance? Yeah. Okay, that'd yeah. be good. Thanks. I mean, in general terms, anything that once the session is over, is, if there's more information you want to feed in, or things that you, you feel as if you could expand on, then we're more than happy to take a further response from it. Us. Yeah, it was just and some time ago, to be honest. Yeah. So I can't remember the details of it. Okay, uh, Rona Mackay. <coughs> Good morning, Sarah. Good morning, John. Um, just to we follow up from Angus's question, did you contact your MPs and, and the Westminster government? Have you made representations to them? Um, specifically, we've contacted MSPs about this because, I mean, we're, we're always very in touch with our MPs about, you know, ongoing problems. And I'm sure, you, well, you're, you're about to go down and see people in London as well, but I mean... You know, we've yeah, I've been to see Ashton and, and um, I speak to lots of people in the party. Um, yeah. Deirdre Brock, um, uh -huh. Ben McPherson. No, it's fine. I just wondered if there was a balance of, of going to Westminster as well. Constantly um, lobbying. Yeah, but, but yeah, Chris Law's been very good in, yeah. in raising issues this week. Good. Okay. Um, well, you know, at the outset, I'd like to say there's a lot of what you said I totally agree with and uh, with regard to the UK government's benefit cuts. Um, but I just want to also say that you, you will know we only get 15% of the powers here of social security powers um, so that does you know tie our hands as much as you know decreasing budgets do but what i'm interested to know is i was going to ask you about the sort of human and financial costs of this but i think you've outlined that well in your your statement so i don't want you to have to i think we all know what the human and financial costs of these cuts are but i'm interested to know what your views on a citizen's income might be i would very very supportive i think that would be um it would just solve so many problems and and just provide a ba I mean a base that people could go from. I mean I think and that it's there's different ways of looking at a citizen's income and it has to be a citizen's income it isn't instead obviously of all the, the things that society provides like um, you know health and education and all these other things because you can have a very let's say, right-wing citizen's income that just says this is it, now you're on your own, mate. But a citizen's income that's as well as, as all those things that provided, I think would be fantastic. It's been very, very encouraging seeing the growth of interest. I'm, I'm amazing growth of interest in it for, for obvious reasons. I think one of the interesting things about um, child benefit and the call for extra help on child benefit is actually that's in that sort of vein that I mean child benefit well apart from recently when it was removed from the very top which I, I don't think was the right decision because you should tax people more at the top not take away what should be a universal benefit and make all the sort of bring in all the means testing stuff I mean the point about a universal benefit is it's universal um, but actually a five pounds on child benefit that's kind of in that same sort of vein as a universal basic income and in the same way it would you know it, it would be for everybody people it's the most effective way of making sure people get get what's needed um, and it's and you, do, you know people don't feel they have to plead for it it's, it's yours by right yeah thank you that's interesting um, there's a very good report that was written by Ontario Coalition Against Poverty, who are people that we have a relationship with. Um, uh, I'd be happy to provide it to the committee. I, I think, in principle, it's a, a good idea, but um, I think that there are many pitfalls that um, need to be avoided um, in rolling one out. Um, so, um, and just 
as I would just echo what um, Sarah had said, that um, provided it's not going to take away from other areas, um, I think in principle it makes sound economic sense. Mm -hmm. Can I ask you, John, um, when you talked about the assessments and the, you know, the terrible nature of, of what disabled people are having to put up with just now, are you encouraged by... Um, you know, the future plans of, the, of the, the, our own social security system, that there won't be revolving door assessments and that, you know, people will be treated with dignity and respect. Does that give you any comfort? I know it's not next year, but, you know, when we can do it. Um, certainly, um, I just wish that it could happen more quickly. Um, I, I think uh, it's quite alien to um, most Scots, the kind of scapegoating that has gone on um, in the right-wing press um, these past seven years. Yeah. Um, I think that no matter who you are in Scotland, there's always a sense of we're all jock times in Japan. Um, and we uh, there's still a, a larger degree of social solidarity, I, would, I, 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 I believe. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I just think that um, it's going to be a hard job because... Um, well, it's great that... Uh, you know, we don't want for-profit uh, companies yes. assessing, having anything to do with the assessment of disabled people. Mm -hmm. In fact, we don't want um, uh, assessments that are based on um, a pseudo-scientific model called the biopsychosocial model of disability, which is complete nonsense. Mm -hmm. has much to do with evidence-based medicine. Mm -hmm. Never much, let alone, okay, there's the medical model. We don't want that. I mean, more of a holistic approach. But, but uh, this is just simply... Um, catastrophic, uh, this assessment regime. Mm -hmm. um, we'd like to see it done away with altogether. Mm -hmm. um, we don't think it saved money. We don't think it makes any economic sense. We think it's been profoundly damaging for society and for the economy. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Thanks, okay, thanks Rona. Uh, Brian Whittle. Thank you, Kavina, and good morning, Mr. McCarlin. Good morning, Dr. Glenn. Thank you for coming in to give us some evidence. Um, I was when we were considering your position, uh, petition, at the same time uh, uh, as the Social Security Bill is being scrutinised by the Social Security Committee, and I note that you contributed to the Scottish Government consultation uh, on, on the bill and made a submission in response to the Social Security Committee's call for evidence on stage one of the bill. Have you made any representations regarding amendments you would like to see to that bill at stage two to deliver some of the changes that you, you're asking for in your petition? Um, yes, I'm trying to remember what the details of them actually were. Well, we can send it. We can send it to That'd you. But we are, we we have we did submit. I mean, it, um, God. Um, you can let us. If it is, yeah, I, I, I can. I can. I can, I can the areas I can, of interest are the areas yeah. I want to focus on. I mean, it's interesting that I think Social Security is sitting as we speak, so they're actually going yeah. through some of these so earlier on ones the, so. on the screen. I mean, just following up from what John was saying just now, I mean, we are very... Con I mean, there was enormous excitement, obviously, and particularly about, you know, the, that it's going to be a more dignified approach and everything, but then dismay, really, among people and, and a lot of disillusion at, at, the, at the delay. That, um, and obviously that debate's passed, but the question now is what can we do, as John was referring to, to, to help the people who are being hit now? Because I think by the time um, it's be it becomes devolved, there'll be a full... Uh, 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 it's expected that everybody will be on PIP. Um, the transfer will be complete. Um, and so there will be a lot of people who will have lost out meanwhile, and people... People, for example, I mean, could the Scottish wealth, or this is something that we have raised and um, I think have raised in that document you're asking me about, um, could the Scottish Welfare Fund be used, we certainly raised it with the Minister anyway, um, be used as a vehicle for helping people who are suffering mobility problems now, maybe even lost their mobility vehicle and as a consequence been really isolated and had their you know, their ability to lead an independent life pretty devastated. So this is a discretionary fund, but it's a fund that has, although there are more and more needs for it, and Universal Credit is going to be putting more and more calls on it because of all the, the delays and the debt and everything and the general bureaucratic me mess-ups that happen with it, um, 
there's going to be more and more calls on it, but that Scottish Welfare Fund has stayed the same for the last three years. And, and yet that's a quite a flexible way of providing help to people who most need it. So maybe, um, you know, is this a vehicle? And I'm not an expert on all the legal things of it, but could this be a, a vehicle for helping people with vehicles? Yeah, sorry about that. <laughs> Um, Michelle, and these are the last couple of questions. So. Um, good morning, both of you, and thank you for coming. Um, you provide an example in your petition about how you consider the Scottish Government could make changes to the tax system as a mitigation measure, and obviously some of that is happening at the moment through the budget, but could you expand for me on that and what you would like to see in terms of changes to the tax system? Well, it's got a bit more progressive, but, you know, by mm -hmm. changing those bars and changing where the different levels come in, it could be more dramatically progressive. And I think possibly easier to do that earlier in a parliament because so that people can see that actually it doesn't affect the majority of people. It affects only those at the top. Um, I think there's, there's also things where taxes are being misspent. I mean, uh, uh, the one that I would absolutely single out is the, the help that's been given to first-time buyers, and it's been pointed out that this doesn't really much help first-time buyers, and it is all it does is push up the prices of housing for everybody, so it's, it's economically not a good measure at all. Um, but the other thing we, we raised was um, change replacing council tax with a land value tax and um, I have a background in housing so um, the, that's actually something I've argued before from a housing perspective as well that it actually not only is it a much more progressive system um, but it's a system that can actually be used to limit um, property speculation and stop houses and housing being as absurdly as expensive as it is in this country. All right. So, so do you have any concept of, of when you talk about, um, you know, the taxation being more progressive, so that it would just hit the ones at the top? So, so do you have any thoughts about where you'd like to see that pitched? I, I'm not a tax expert. I know there are lots of people who 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 have done more. I just think, you know. The, the changes have, that we've seen have been really very small, um, and I, you know, and if one looks back historically, of course, I mean, people are the, the, the or even at, at other countries, and the Nordic countries obviously would be the first ones one would think of. There are there are places with much higher taxation systems, and it certainly doesn't mean that people leave the country because people recognise that those taxation systems are actually paying for much better services for everybody. And I think not, probably not enough notice has been taken about all the work that's been done as well on the advantages of a more equal society, the work by Wilkinson and Pickett. Um, looking at the advantages of a, qual of a gr more equal society actually for everybody, even for people at the it's top. It's Michael Marmot. Mm. It's Michael Marmot as well, the mm. public health epidemiologist. I think the problem is a great deal of this is to do with um, <clears throat> the fact that um, Scotland doesn't have the economic levers to, um, to crack down on tax evasion and avoidance. Um, that's reserved to Westminster. So I think that uh, our elected representatives must keep up the pressure to make sure that um, Westminster really does the business um, in collecting the tax which is owed um, and avoided because corporations are simply not pulling their fair share. It's absolutely scandalous, um, the uh, Bermuda Papers and so on. Um, it's high time people stepped up to the plate and paid their fair share because people are really, really suffering in this society. And it's to do with uh, people who take, 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 who are already obscenely wealthy and give nothing back. Okay. In, in any of the campaigning or discussions that you've had on the issues raised in your petition, and, and you've mentioned a couple, but are there any other ways of mitigating reductions in the welfare spending other than the taxation system that you've considered? Sorry, in bringing more money in, you mean? 
Well, to, to, you know, how how can they be mitigated other than tax? So, I mean, you, you've mentioned a couple in the sense that you said use the welfare fund in, in a more um, open way, you know, allow more people. Well, but but at the moment, the fund would still be the same. Well, so you'd all need, you'd do no, is no, you'd need to put more, Sorry, I'm talking about... Put, you definitely would need to put more money in if it was going to mm. do more. Well, the, the other thing is, is, as we mentioned earlier, more funding for advice so that people can actually get... Mm. You know, more people can get the benefits that they should be due, which actually are part of the Westminster system, and that would be a, obviously a, a a very a very good bit of funding. But you know, when one's looking at at the at the funding figures, the amount of you know it is a stitch in time thing. It is if you if you help people so that their lives don't fall apart, so that you know, because you you speak so often speak to someone and one small thing's happened and then you know they're going to say and then my marriage broke down and then we both needed homes and then I didn't get somewhere where my um, children could come and visit and you know it's just one thing leads to another thing so if you can stop stop it right at the beginning with good advice with that bit of extra funding at the beginning it's actually it makes economic sense too and and those people can play a fuller part in society. I mean, it's just wasteful for individuals. It's wasteful for society. Um, and the areas that are being deprived as well are geographically very concentrated quite often. So those are areas, you know, it's if, if a little bit more money went to those families, that money would be in that local community and it would make those whole local communities more viable as well. So I think there's, you know, it's, it makes, there's a really strong economic case um, just an economic case for more money for people right at the bottom. So in the, in the current um, envelope of spending, if you like, um, I mean, you've, you've mentioned ensuring that all tax due is paid. Um, now, obviously, evasion is illegal, avoidance isn't, so there's a question mark around that and whether you feel tax laws should be changed and tightened up. But is it within the envelope of spending that we have at the moment, are there things that you think we shouldn't be spending that should be redirected into to welfare spending, you know, to mitigate some of these issues? Well, I just gave the example. Or do you think we should just be raising more money to... I, to I think, just, I mean, mm. what, what I hate to see, and, and you know, that it's so easy you, um, to say, oh, uh, to raise this with people, and they say, oh, yes, but we're already, you know, we're committed to spending money on this and money on that. We're not, you know, the last thing I want to do is say you shouldn't, be, you know, raising public sector pay or providing proper funding for the councils. Those things are absolutely vital, and that's why we need to actually raise more money. I, the, the whole point of phrasing it in the way that we did was to say, you know, there is more money there. We're a really wealthy country. Um, we're not, you know, we, vital things shouldn't be set against each other and so we do need to raise more money but as I said I did give the example of um, I don't think putting actually more money into first time buyers is helpful for anybody <laughs> but I'm not sure what the, the sum of money it's involved there but I'm sure it's a sum of money that for a lot of the people we're talking about could make a real significant difference okay, thank you. Okay. We'll finish. Okay, thanks. Um, community. I'm just going back to the land value tax. Um, I, I was pleased to see you mention it in your papers and uh, throughout the course of, of your, your uh, um, contributions this morning. Um, uh, clearly, um, it, it's an idea that's been mooted in this Parliament for uh, a number of years now, um, but it does seem to be gaining traction. Um, and well, to the extent that the Scottish Government's programme for government has tasked the new Scottish Land Commission with. Uh, uh, a review on um, uh, the, the introduction of a land based uh, uh, land value based tax um, but as part of your research uh, into that aspect of it uh, apart from the work that Andy Whiteman's done have you um, looked at any examples in uh, say northern Europe or, or further afield where land value based tax uh, works I, I, I don't I haven't actually no, no. okay um, but I'm glad that, the, you know, that it is being looked at, and I know there's a huge amount of interest in it. And I mean, I know it's been discussed over the, well, over the last century, really, here, but it, it has, has to be done properly and fully, I think. And I'm very interested in it and how it can... It's got so many good things in bringing in, you know, when you've got land improved due to 
some government spending. It's, a, it's the most efficient way of getting the, the, the benefits of that improvement to come back to the public as well. So there's, there's many, many good aspects of it. OK, I'm sure we'll all wait to see what comes back mm -hmm. uh, from the Scottish Land Commission. Very briefly, Michelle. Yeah, I, I just want to ask one last question, actually, and it, it sort of leapt out at me when I, I read your petition initially, in that you wrote to everybody except the Conservative group, and you didn't write to, to any of us. Is that because you just feel it's totally pointless, or is is that a, a political stance in terms of your your decision making? Well, it was it was writing to say when you know mitigate the cuts that's being brought about by the conservative party in westminster so i suppose it was just a thought that you know i was assuming that you were behind the the party policy in westminster but even so so surely logically you would still write and okay. pre present time, your evidence next time you'll get a letter as well <laughs> thank you <laughs> if we create some more rebels that would be quite interesting um can i just thank you very much uh, for for coming along. I think that's been really useful, um, quite thought-provoking, because there have been some solutions suggested in there as well. And it is interesting that Social Security Committee is sitting in parallel to us, and we'll obviously be wrestling with some of the nitty-gritty in this. I suppose it's a question of what do we want to do with this petition at this stage? By writing to the Minister and, and getting their view um, of the petition in front of us. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah. Brian? I think also because of the work that's been done by uh, other committees, I think there's that, that cross-reference to the Social Security uh, Committee, I think would be uh, interesting yeah. to see where, where, uh, where they, they have gone with us to see whether or not we can feed into that, to that particular committee or whether or not that committee should actually uh, take this petition over. Yeah. Can I, say, I think the... Um, the, the consensus that we write to the Scottish Government to get a specific response to your request, to what extent they would consider mitigating welfare cuts, have they looked at other things in the budget that they would, you know, you've made one suggestion, presumably there are others, to test this argument, well we haven't got any money elsewhere, but you know, what would they look at, and just to get a response from them on, on the idea again of the Scottish Welfare Fund being increased, but also support for people to access benefits, because I think there's an argument around supporting people to be sure they're entitled to. I mean, there is a frustration, I think, in the system. It's not just that there's a cut that people have to deal with, but actually getting access to what they're entitled to has also been limited by cuts elsewhere. Um, so I think that would be worthwhile as an initial response. And I think after that, at that point, we might think about, and maybe we can flag up Social Security, this petition is um, going through, just flag up to them that this is something that we will need to make a decision on the next time, whether it would be appropriate to pass it on to them or perhaps there's some more work that we can do. But I think at this stage we'd be agreeing certainly to get an initial response um, from the Scottish Government to the evidence that you've presented today, if that's agreeable. OK, in that case, can I thank you again for your attendance and I'll suspend the meeting briefly to allow a change over of witnesses. Order. Um, the next petition is Petition 1678 on a national strategic framework for countryside ranger <coughs> services in Scotland. 
The petition was submitted by uh, Ranger Robert Reid on behalf of the Scottish Countryside Rangers Association. And we'll take evidence from Ranger Reid this morning, and he is accompanied by George Potts, who is the chairperson of the Scottish Countryside Rangers Association. Can I welcome you both to the meeting? Um, can I invite you to provide a brief opening statement of no more than five minutes, after which we will move to questions from committee members. Okay, sure. okay. Okay. Um, we are here today on behalf of our association seeking your support for our petition asking the Scottish Government to implement the strategic framework for ranger services as set out in the document Rangers in Scotland. Convener, within the Rangers in Scotland report it states that there are over 300 full-time equivalent posts in this sector with an expectation that this number would grow. We can show that in the last 10 years, at least 100 ranger posts have been lost. And we are deeply concerned by this, the impact on service delivery, the impact on the environmental and social benefits that rangers can deliver, and also the impact on those remaining and their career prospects. This is not a planned reduction. It's random, unstructured and ill-considered and we feel we're now at crisis point. The strategy uh, marked a watershed as the direct link between Scottish natural heritage and the local authority ranger services that they had grant aid agreements with was broken. However, the structure and function of ranger services, their role within local authorities and other funded bodies was by that time well established. The training and background of countryside rangers across Scotland resulted in a significant degree of continuity from the model that SNH was able to support. A couple of employing authorities did attempt to redefine the role of their rangers, particularly trying to break down into their constituent parts the jobs. But almost without exception, this diminished the role of those involved and created vulnerable services where previously strong ones with an established track record had operated. Um, I would advise you that uh, Scottish Natural Heritage still operate successful grant aid agreements with NGOs, community-based and private sector ranger services. These partnerships continue to prosper and act as a vital conduit in the delivery of SNH's corporate strategy. Um, looking at the relationship between Scottish Natural Heritage and local authority services, our association feel the main casualty of this change was the loss of national reporting on the outputs of Scotland's Rangers that SNH was able to coordinate and in doing so provide the comprehensive picture of what Rangers deliver across Scotland and benchmark that against the continued investment of grant aid. Now, we know of a social return on investment study done at that time, which showed a return of £10 to every pound invested. Convener, a significant investment of public money had, had been made over 44 years to create ranger services across Scotland with both a local and a national identity. And these operated under the guidance and support of a government agency and ensured that national priorities were recognised in the delivery of local services. Uh, recognised too by the use of our National Ranger Service Badge, the only one in the world that has people on it. And this acts as a charter mark and a quality standard in our sector. Now, this model works extremely well and has been copied by other countries in the development of their countryside ranger services. And it's led to the formation by Scottish rangers of the International Ranger Federation, which is now in 90 member countries. Now, we feel this leading role will soon be lost as the capacity of rangers in Scotland to deliver falls into terminal decline. In conclusion, I would draw your attention to the public support our petition received and, in particular, the many supportive comments made. 
the wider public recognise and value the range of services as part of that national approach. And we feel that the government and relevant agencies should be asked to revisit this 2008 policy document. 2008. Well, this document is still relevant, is still aspirational, and if it's properly implemented and monitored, will begin to address the issues that we bring to your attention today and help secure the important asset that is Rangers in Scotland. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much for that. Can I begin by asking just a wee bit about the background of the National Strategic Framework, which is 2008. Maybe you can say a wee bit more. I mean, you've ref you have referred to about who was involved in it, the preparation of the framework, what the tension was behind it, which I think, again, you flagged up. But I'm interested in whether you realised when you were developing that in 2008 that this, what seems to have been the critical decision, which was in 2009, um, with the Local Government Finance Distribution Review, I understand, where it became part of the main settlement to local authorities. When you were developing <coughs> the framework, did you see that coming? And what, at that point, when that was on its way, were the representations in opposition to it because you believed that what was going to happen is what has happened? Well, um, well really, uh, our involvement in that was very small, mainly on the edges. It was uh, organisations like COSLA, it was organisations like Scottish Natural Heritage who um, basically put that strategic plan together and sort of uh, gave it the nod. Now, that's as to the 2008 what one, sorry. So, that's the 2008 one. Uh, so therefore, uh, that was that was basically put on the table. Right. Uh, and I don't know whether it was ever looked at to address it in the future, but some employers and SNH have looked, looked at that particular document and basically there's targets there and these targets are being made. Unfortunately, the, the, the problem that we have is that the number of rangers to meet these targets are uh, declining. The new pressures that's coming on, the, the, the rangers who are left to deal with it um, are having an impact effect on their health and their welfare. And also the loss of jobs is, uh, is a career opportunity mm -hmm. downhill. Mm -hmm. um, and these are concerns that we have. Okay. It's maybe worth saying that our association is totally voluntary. For 40 years, it's based on a voluntary of the rangers who run and support okay. the association. So in 2008, COSLA, SNH produced what they thought was a really good kind of blueprint for the future. Yep. And it would it would be to have still have a national framework that you, if you knew if you came across a countryside range in one part of the country, there would be a connection with someone in another part. But the decision in 2009, which is to bundle up the money and give it to local government, mm. and you we'd no say that we we we'd no in, <clears throat> in, input to that whatsoever. Um, but you, but you believe that that is where the change has been yes. because there wasn't a discrete fund to yes. support a nationwide approach. Yep. Okay. The national reporting that uh, SNH would coordinate uh, is still in that document. So we believed at that time that they would still take an active interest in in the outputs of Rangers and uh, the type of work that they were asked to do. So, so the point now is that SNH, where they grant aid to the NGOs and, and various. Uh, states, um, they, they still have to return national figures, but local authorities don't need to return national figures. So we don't know. There's no one, really, no one in Scotland knows how many ranges we have. Um, we are working a survey at the moment. We'd hope to have had it completed for today, but uh, at the moment we're about 50% through doing that stat, uh, survey, and um, it looks as if um, yes, we've lost 100 rangers posts in Scotland. Uh, there's a lot of good news coming out as well because we're asking a lot of other questions as per the range of service delivery, which is very much meeting all the targets which is in uh, the strategic plan. So we, we, we as, as people on the ground are, are delivering uh, on a daily basis. But the, the, the basic decision was to lift ring fencing from the yes. money to local government yes. with yes. a consequence that yeah. I think has probably been true in other no. areas as well. Okay, that's very helpful. Thank you. Brian Whittle. Thank you. Yeah, good morning, Mr. Potts, Mr. Reid. Um, uh, this, as you've already suggested, the strategic framework dates back to 2008, and, and that's almost a decade since that work was done. And I wonder if anything has changed in terms of the initial concerns that prompted the development of that framework. Um, to, to, 
the framework was how could we put it was um, brought to us. We didn't have any input to that framework, so therefore, you know, it was your know, countryside rangers. You will that's what you'll deliver. It was a new approach to what had to take place. We had, we we had no uh, way of asking the questions or having any input as to what the impacts would be of these, but um, we had to implement them on the ground as and when they came in. In terms of changes, um, no, not really. Uh, Bob and I, between us, have 70 years of experience. And in essence, we did the same job. We just changed the language in which we did it. So we moved from uh, promoting country parks to uh, biodiversity to access, and then latter year to health. But the, the job was much the same. And, and th that, that document reflected a distillation of that experience um, Scotland-wide um, and, and really set the tone for how we could go forward. Okay, if I can convene it, why, I was just asking why you consider the 2008 framework uh, it would still be relevant today and, and, and in terms of what, you know, what benefits it would bring to the provision of uh, ranger services? Um. <laughs> Basically, the range of services are delivering it on a daily basis. Um, the trouble being is that we don't have a number of people to deliver it, to, 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 to impact it in the way that that document was hopefully going to take it. Um, so you still, you, the, the 2008 is, is, is still relevant? Yes. Today, yes. And you would still yes. Do it oh, very much so. I mean, that, that's what the, the range of today are out delivering uh, and meeting. Uh, Scottish Government targets, meeting the EU targets, and meeting, uh, meeting uh, Westminster targets as to biodiversity and all the other aspects mm -hmm. which come within the job remit. Um, so, yes, yeah, so the range of services evolved to, to take, has been, I wouldn't say evolved, but has had to absorb a lot of changes which have come through uh, naturally from mm -hmm. European Union, from Westminster, and from mm -hmm. the Scottish Government. So, we, 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 we are trying to meet the requirements that are made of us. Because our employers are forced, forcing that, uh, in the sense being that they have to report back that they are meeting the targets. So it filters down to the ranger, filters back up to the head head of departments, and therefore that's how the, the stats are brought together. Yeah, so you, yeah. you, you're, you would ascertain it's a numbers issue. Mm -hmm. okay. Yes. Good morning, gentlemen. Um, my question was going to be: Is the framework still referred to? by stakeholders at the time when it was first introduced to, and you've really answered that with, uh, to Mr Whittle. Can I ask you, um, you talked about the survey that you're doing, what, what, um, when do you expect that to be complete and, and what, do you, what are your plans for that? What are you actually going to do with it when you get the information? Um, we, were, we, were, we were hoping that today's thing would make been next month where we probably would have had it completed. Unfortunately, we, we don't have that. Um, it's, a, it's a telephone conversation with every range of service in Scotland, uh, roughly a 15, 20-minute uh, survey, uh, asking a lot of questions concerning um, the numbers, the ro roles that they're delivering, mm -hmm. and some have changed. Um, so, so that in itself brings that in. We're also finding out questions within that survey of how our association sits. Uh, and are we delivering what our members e express? Mm -hmm. uh, I would hope by the end of end of uh, February we would have that document together. As to what we do with that, um, um, I, th I think what the evidence that seems to be coming out of it is that um, a, maybe government should do a stat, major stats on it, because we are not statisticians. We are uh, basically concerned people who are trying to look after our members' welfare. Mm -hmm. so. And just of the jobs that have been lost, um, who's, who's, is someone fulfilling those? Who's actually doing the jobs? Or are the, uh, no with those jobs not being done? No, no one. There have been some reconfigurations in certain services, but that deals with who's heads of departments and what departments are actually attached to. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. So, yeah, the, it, it's one of these areas where um, we, we, we see that senior range of posts have been lost. Uh, main grade posts and seasonal posts are being lost. And seasonal posts basically back up the range of service in the busy time of year when Scotland's going through its tourism boom. 
Uh, so therefore, we have less people on the ground to actually mm -hmm. provide a professional service. Are there some areas that are better than others in terms of holding on to or is, you know, keeping the, the ranger service going? Think about rural areas or particularly tourist areas? Or? Well, the, the, maybe the example is that the Highland Council in the last two financial years uh, basically were axing the whole of the ranger service. Mm -hmm. um, from that, they, some, they, they have now been moved into a trust. We were also finding out in the survey that even with rangers who had been put into local authority trusts a number of years ago, are not ha not secure in their job and feel that they are they are basically at the targets at this next round of cuts. Mm -hmm. So, you know, uh, mo moving them from one organisation to another, local authorities taking a big has been taking the big hit. But we're now finding that uh, organisations like um, um, National Trust for Scotland are, are looking at shedding 79 members of staff. In the rounds of cuts at the moment, and uh, we know that rangers are within that as well. Okay. Uh, and uh, it's maybe worth saying that in one local authority, maybe four weeks ago, they did an interview for a ranger post, they appointed the ranger, and they've now paid him off. Okay. So that's the crisis. Yep. Okay, thank you. I note from the evidence that the, the, um, when there's been a transfer from Highland Council to High Life Highland, I think they call it, the council itself has said that there's been a reduction. Of countryside ranger posts from 22 to 10.5 full-time equivalent posts. So I think it's also worth uh, uh, noting that, uh, well, 2008 is, is, is the point that, that we've taken this reading from. Um, within the sort of uh, 1996 period, uh, there was a lot of job losses as well. So this is this is probably a second round of redu reduction that's taking place. And one of the reasons for that is that local authorities under uh, various um, uh, legislation have to had, had to appoint access officers. Well, the ranger service did the job before the access officers were there. Uh, the biodiversity officers, there's conservation officers. So there are jobs in the, the countryside there, but they, they, they divert away from the wide role that the ranger provides. Okay. In, in terms of the survey, we can, once you've got that completed, it would be helpful for us yes. perhaps to get yep. um, a copy of it. Um, in your survey, are you expecting to get an indication of the numbers of rangers that are? We are working on that at the moment. Um, maybe just worthwhile got a wee clip here as to the amount at the moment. The uh, over over 34 services, uh, this is done by a service by service. Um, the senior rangers posts have been lost at 17 and they're at the moment sitting at 24.5. The rangers at the moment are sitting at 147 and a half and uh, there have been a loss there of 50 posts and uh, seasonals. Um, we have we, there's 44 there, but there have been 33 lost. That's uh, only halfway through the survey. Okay, so. thank you very much for that, Michelle Ballantyne. Thank you. Good morning, gentlemen. Um, in your petition, you refer to the Ranger Development Partnership and the Ranger Manager Forum. Can you explain who is involved in these groups and what sort of things they discuss? Scottish National Her Heritage Forest Commission. Um, National Trust, uh, I think um, Historic Environment Scotland is involved in that. There are representations for National Park, Loch mm -hmm. Lomond, and there are representations from Cosla. Right, uh, so. I think there's one or two uh, who are local authority. Right. Uh, we, we feel as an organisation we now need to go and write to every ranger authority, mm -hmm. uh, council or employer, to uh, state our concerns at the moment. So, so in that group, you said, and in some of them, local authority. So, so the key funders, employers, aren't involved. Then this is well, from local authority point of view, yeah, yeah. Uh, through Cosler, it would be, but we have not been in these discussions, and there has not been a meeting for potentially two years, as far as I'm aware. Of either group. O of the group, yeah. Who, who, uh, yeah. Right. Okay. Yeah. And, and what sort of things did they discuss when they were active then? Well, well, some of the things we discuss is that. Um, um, the association has uh, developed a, a, a professional qualifications for rangers, mm -hmm. uh, so therefore that would be part of the discussions. We have uh, developed other programmes, uh, mm -hmm. which hopefully, as an association, that employers uh, would consider taking on board, such as the uh, Scottish Student Ranger Programme, um, the Challenge Award. Um, but the problem being that we're finding is that through doing this survey, that the services do not have the capacity to promote these or take them forward. So the the policies and guidelines for rangers, you know, that they work to, mm -hmm. 
are they done by your association and updated, no. or are they just stagnating now? Then no, the, the, the whole range of system came out of the um, formation of the Countryside Scotland Act mm -hmm. uh, and uh, the Countryside Commission for Scotland <laughs> were the people who drew up the how could you put it the uh, the vision mm -hmm. as to what the ranges in Scotland would be, and I would say they got it right. Mm -hmm. um, the park system for Scotland, which would be bring in country parks, regional parks, mm -hmm. and at that time special parks, because national was not a word that they would use. Mm -hmm. So um, the outcome of that is that um, we find that um, things are not as they were, and, and the, whereas we, we, as George and I would say, the good old days, <laughs> when, when through government funding, we were... Our, our, the, the, the carrot it was put forward was a 75% grant from central government at that mm -hmm. time to establish this system. Mm -hmm. uh, it was recognised that the system was required because of the implications that were taking place on the ground. Yeah. 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 Okay. Can I Thank just you. pick yeah. up on, on a word that you used, which was stagnating? Um, we, that word we're not familiar with. Um, this is a, a very young and a vibrant uh, profession. Uh -huh. And there are a lot of young people with energy and enthusiasm who take forward new ideas, share best practice, um, and ensure that the service that they are delivering is relevant to, to the customers that they have. So there have been many changes over these years, and a lot of these changes have been led by the rangers themselves. Uh -huh. um, so the profession doesn't really stagnate in that sense because we have all these young people coming through we have new challenges, new legislation to meet, mm -hmm. and new requirements from the employing authorities. So, so your policy guidelines, your qualifications, all that. I was really referring to Mr. Reid's comment that the, the committees hadn't met for two years, and that was where it was done. So that's that was what I was asking in terms of, does yeah. that mean I, things have stagnated in that two years, or has somebody else taken but, on the work? But, well, yeah. I, I, I suppose mm. it's about establishing just how powerful this little group is that gets together mm -hmm. in that sense, representing the industry. Um, mm. uh, to, to, to me, it may not cover the wider scope as we may, should, we may expect it to do. So really you've lost a voice by that, that group not meeting. And do we know why they're not meeting? Um, no, not really. Uh, I think possibly it'd be the pressures has been put on the association having just to d deliver and survive at the moment. Um, right. So if things just slip to the side or someone has not picked up the, the gauntlet um, okay. to, to actually move it forward. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay, and Mr John? Thanks, um, Commissioner. And I note that you uh, met with the chair of SNH in 2016, uh, and and you've li liaised regularly with a nominated member from SNH uh, since then, um, t as you put it, to exchange information and address concerns. Um, have you found this helpful in terms of the relationship between the Ranger Service and SNH? And can you advise whether there's been any direct approach to the Scottish Government on the, on this matter? Um, we have a good relationship with SNH. Uh, we're a linked person. Um, Alison Matheson and Inverness. Um, we're well supported in that sense. As to how, how we um, take it forward, um, I'm not sure if uh, SNH, like many other organisations, seem to be going through the the, uh, the movement of change. Um, Forestry Commission seems to be going through a movement of change. Um, so we, we think possibly at uh, decision level at, at SNH it may, may not feature as we did in the past. Um, but uh, we, we're in a, a sort of unknown period at the moment uh, within the sort of, I would say, the industry, uh, which relates to the countryside, either it be forestry, historic Scotland, or the private sector, or the estates. Um, okay, th there is of course a new chair at SNH, so yes. it may well be worth uh, requesting a meeting with, with him. Um, I'm sure there's he. We, we've, we've had him in front of our uh, environment committee, and he's willing to look at the, a number of issues. So this might be an opportune moment to to, to speak to the new chair. Well, we, we I think we, we are uh, in the process of seeking a, a meeting at the moment on that. Yes, we we, we see that and. Um, I'm just looking here from a quote from the last chair, uh, the last CEO of uh, SNH. 
and it was back in 2014, and it states that the, the best value for the National Health Service in Scotland is the Scotland's Ranger Service. There you go. Yeah. Um, the, at, at, at the moment, through this survey, we, we, we can see that already there's about 13 million uh, visitors if you put all the Ranger Services that we've serviced together. So we, we provide a big service over a wide area. Uh, and a professional service, that's our pride. Envied elsewhere, the Danish government picked up the Scottish system. The English and Welsh uh, Rangers associations are so jealous that we have a national identity. They don't have it. And we're partly almost to lose that. And it may be worth to say that that logo is in this parliament as part of the petitions committee exhibition in the foyer. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, Michelle Bolton. Yeah, um, I understand that rangers are employed in a wide variety of, um, by a wide variety of employers in a range of sectors. So how does the framework apply in relation to rangers that are employed in the private sector? And do you know whether the implementation of the framework would be supported by, you know, for example, landowners? Yes. Yeah, so yeah, the, 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 land, the, the framework uh, applies across the board, whether they be NGOs, local authorities, or private sector, or yeah. community or island community. Um, so yeah, the, the, it, it goes over that whole area. And we're also finding in the private sector that the, some rangers are not, while they've still been grant aided, uh, still fear that their jobs are not secure, even in the private sector at the moment. Um, right, because the general atmosphere is one of, it's an area that can be let go. Yeah, it's, yeah it seems to be, uh, it, we, we, we have not been able to, to have any, um, what's the word I'm looking for, overall protection uh, as a Scottish National Ranger Service, which we are. Okay. Thank you. Okay, I think we've, we've reached the end of our question. Thank you very much for that. Um, we now need to think about how we're going to take this forward, and I wonder if there are any suggestions, Brian? I, I uh, remiss at the start of this, I could have, should have declared an interest in my brother-in-law is actually a ranger, so, although not in Scotland, uh, and th England have the same issues that you're currently raising just now. Um, I, I would think, firstly, we should write to the Scottish Government to seek their view on the, on the petition as a starting mm -hmm. point. Thank you. I think it would be interested in their views about how much do they perceive the importance of a national um, service and what they were, are they recognising what you describe as the changes as a consequence of the decisions in 2009? Mm -hmm. um, I, I think we could maybe write to other organisations of an interest in the land, Forestry Commission and National Trust being two. Um, well, I'll just seek their mm -hmm. thoughts and position because they've obviously been directly involved. Yeah, whether there's any conversation yeah. that haven't taken the ring fencing off, have they mm -hmm. been tracking what's happened? Mm -hmm. Anyone else? Um, well, in addition to cause, I, I wonder if we could maybe write to every single local authority, mm -hmm. um, just to, yeah, ra rather yeah. than just get an overall view from Cosla, yeah. mm -hmm. um, because it'd be good to get the figures from each local authority as to how many rangers they've still got employed, and not just not just um, not just the um, a local authorities, but any alios that are associated, because we've yeah. seen we've seen High Life Highland uh, and the reduction there. Now that's an alio, presumably. Mm -hmm. So um, we need to we need to get figures from from them too. Okay. I think you know, in the Highland region at the moment, where the, the tourist industry is homing in in Sky and the Fairies Pool, there is no range of service in Sky now. Really? No, and that's what rangers have been trained to do, is to mm -hmm. actually deliver and manage people in the countryside. Uh, that's our training from the 1970s. Um, and, uh, you know, they, they, these are issues which have far, far, they travel over a wide area, these issues. Thank yep. you. So if, if we're asking the local authorities for their numbers, either via COSL or directly, can we also ask them for their three to five year plan? in terms of ranges as well, we because most of them are forward one. budgeting yeah. um, and if they've got budget cuts yeah. intended, it would be good to know that. Yeah. So, and also the National Park Authorities and Scottish Land and Estates. I don't know whether the likes of Community Land Scotland would have a view whether they manage their land you know, <coughs> in terms of... Crown <coughs> properties have yeah. ranger service. Yep. Yeah. 
if you're if you're looking at um, communities that have taken over land, have they taken over this responsibility as well? So I think there's quite a lot there for us to. Hmm? And SNH itself, of course. Yeah. Um, <coughs> uh, Crown Estate Scotland. Yes, yeah. yeah. Okay, I think that's quite a lot to be going on with. Yeah. And in terms of your survey, you've already said that once you have it in a form that yes. you think we're worth us seeing it, yeah. then we would appreciate that as well. Can I therefore thank you very much for your attendance, for your evidence, and for your uh, answering the questions. It's quite a lot for us to proceed with, and obviously we'll keep you in touch with the progress of the petition. So thank you very much, and can I just suspend briefly to allow the witnesses to leave the table? Come back to order, and we're now moving to uh, agenda item two. So the second agenda item is the consideration of a new petition on which we'll not be taking evidence. Petition 1676 on the Land Registration Etc. Scotland Act 2012 was submitted by Tony Rosser. The petitioner believes there are two major flaws in the Act, and his petition calls on the Scottish Parliament to urge the Scottish Government to review the Act, with particular regard to the cadastral map and the provision of supporting materials members of a copy of the petition and a SPICE briefing. With regard to the cadastral map, the SPICE briefing explains that this is the statutory term given to the map which covers the whole of Scotland. The briefing sets out the current process for mapping in the land register under the 2012 Act, noting that the base map currently used is the Ordnance Survey map. It adds that Section 11.6 of the Act empowers Scottish ministers to make regulations to allow other systems of mapping to be used. The briefing notes that the Registers of Scotland receives 500 updated map tiles per week from Ordnance Survey and explains that Sections 11 and 7 of the Act allows the Registers of Scotland to make consequential changes to the land register when the base map is updated. The petitioner indicates that within this process he would like it to be mandatory for the Registers of Scotland to check the validity of any updated Ordnance Survey maps which he considers will, quote, avoid any inaccuracies or questions about the validity of updated maps. He also considers that where maps are in dispute, the Register of Scotland should arrange a resurvey to be conducted by Ordnance Survey or Register of Scotland and to give proprietors the opportunity to question or approve the revised plan. The SPICE briefing explains that under Section 80 of the Act, the Keeper of the Registers of Scotland must rectify the land register where there is, quote, a manifest inaccuracy in a title sheet or the cadastral map and notes other inaccuracies. It adds that where an individual has a query or concern about an inaccuracy, they can refer it to the Lands Tribunal for Scotland. In recent correspondence with the clerks, the petitioner indicates that he does not recognise this as being the case. He states that he had three refusals to update an error on his title deed plan and was not made aware that he could raise the issue with the Lands Tribunal. The second concern raised in the petition relates to the provision of material in support of requests to the Registers of Scotland for a revision of the deeds, specifically in the event that a property owner has died. The petitioner believes that any such request should be supported by a death certificate. He indicates his understanding that this was 
quote, commonplace under previous legislation and considers that this negates the possibility of error by proprietor or solicitor. The spice briefing refers to correspondence with the registers of Scotland, which states, quote, the keeper takes the view that if a solicitor tells us that a proprietor is deceased, we are entitled to rely on that. I should note here also that the petitioner has contacted the clerks to say that it is not necessary to use a legal person within this process. The clerks have checked this with Spice, who is, which has confirmed that technically the petitioner is correct. Spice would, however, stress that not using a solicitor is rare in practice. Spice notes also that it is often the case that people would use solicitors when dealing with complex matters before the Lands Tribunal, as were referred to previously. The clerk's note indicates that the Economy, Jobs and Whip, uh, Fair Work Committee took evidence on two draft SSIs in November and the instruments were not approved. The Scottish Government subsequently laid a replacement draft instrument, the Registers of Scotland, Digital Registration, etc. Regulations 2018 draft. The Economy, Jobs and Fair Work Committee took evidence on that instrument at its meeting on Tuesday, 30 January and agreed to recommend that the draft regulations be approved. I wonder if members have any comments or suggestions for action. Angus? Yeah, thanks, um, Camina. Um, having served on the, the RACI committee in 2012 when, when it scrutinised the, the land registration bill, um, I have to say I've got some sympathy with, uh, with this petition, and it doesn't seem to me to, to, to be a, a big ask. Um, however, I'd, I'd be keen to know if, if there are capacity issue, issues at the uh, registers of Scotland. Um, before we uh, take this any further. Unfortunately, I can't recall why the need for a, a death certificate wasn't included in the bill uh, or the Act at, at the time, um, but I think there's certainly merit in, in looking at this further. Yeah, well, it did strike me as something that, if it's possible to represent yourself and take the action forward yourself, then that, would that not give everybody comfort that there was a death certificate mm -hmm. rather than relying on the word of a solicitor, but I also think that is there not something in the petitioner's own um, evidence that actually his issue was that his solicitor didn't do the job correctly, yeah. or yeah. that may have been something behind yeah. it, so would this give more confidence? It would be a reasonable question to ask. Ms. Redress is down to you, um, you know, if you find there's been an error, and there's also time bars, and I've actually had a couple of constituents who have come to me with this very problem, so I think there is a need to revisit it and look at it um, you know when you suddenly if you've lived somewhere a long time and then you suddenly find the boundaries moved and you find yourself time barred from, from addressing the issue mm -hmm. that is incredibly inequitable and unfair mm -hmm. um, because you didn't know about it mm -hmm. so you know I think this is something that we really do need to, to take forward and, and have and a look at perhaps in contact was it Register of Scotland I mean again the petitioner says that he didn't know he had the right to appeal to the Lands Tribunal so is there a process is there a form is there information that's provided to him in that situation that would flag that up? It would be worth asking them at. So, yeah, I think the Registers of Scotland is, would be definitely a port of call, and, and maybe there's a need for a, a greater public awareness of what the process actually is and what is available to people. Um, so I think contact them and the, the government, Scottish Government on, on the action called for here. Yeah, and certainly from the Scottish Government's perspective, are they looking at the legislation to ensure that it's doing what they intend yeah. to. Yeah. Is this the kind of example that would allow them to reflect further on what's happened to the legislation? Yeah. It just seems to be, in effect, a loophole, you know, also a gap in things that you know, people are falling through. Yeah. Um, I would hope there aren't an awful lot, but for those who are, it, it's a big issue. Mm -hmm. OK, Brian? I think, you know, noting that the Economy Jobs Fair Work um, Committee just taking take evidence uh, on this instrument, I'd be quite interested to try and cross-reference a little bit and see what kind of ev evidence. Mm -hmm. Although yeah. it does say that they agreed to recommend the draft regulations be approved, yeah. so it might be worth just flagging that up, um, or okay. getting a sense of what, I mean, quite interesting, in fact, that the original ones weren't agreed, so that's maybe something that we can, yeah. we can look at further. So I think there's quite a lot there, then, we'd be agreeing to write to the Scottish Government and writing to the Register of Scotland in the terms that have already been identified, but um, recognising that if there's an issue about people having to deal with a system that's not friendly to them in that sense, what's caused that? So perhaps this issue of capacity is something that would flag up as well. Is that agreed? Yeah. Okay, if that's agreed, um, that uh, ends our conclusion of petitions today. 
um, and can we now move into private session?